What does it mean to be all in the gospel of Jesus Christ? This is the question that I've asked more than 200 people over the last four and a half years. And what I've found is that the answers are just as diverse as the many people I've had the opportunity to meet. I'm Morgan Pearson, host of LDS Living's All In Podcast. Join me for this special TV edition as I sit down with an NBA star turned executive, a concentration camp survivor, a pancake entrepreneur, and a university president. In 1979, the jazz became part of Utah's landscape. About this same time, Danny Ainge was making his mark in Provo as a star college basketball player. He went on to play 14 seasons in the NBA, winning two NBA championships with the Boston Celtics. He coached the Phoenix Suns and worked again in Boston as an executive for the Celtics for 18 years. His return to Utah to work for the Jazz is something of a surprise even for him. But these Utah connections may have never happened if it weren't for the encouragement of an apostle when he was a young high school player. Elder Ashton just asked to interview me. I, I was like, what is this about? I got an apostle coming to our stake and like, why does he want to talk to me? So that was a little nerve wracking, but I met with him. He said, I would never tell you where to go to school, but I think that if you want to live the rules at BYU, um, you should at least go on a visit there just to take a look at it. And I said I would. Once you ended up in the NBA, you faced some, some negativity and you were booed by crowds and, and not a favorite amongst opposing fans. I was kind of a whiner, like very demonstrative player, you know, wore my emotions like, what, that call, are you kidding? Here we go, Danny Ainge, oh, a free for all. During his 18 year professional basketball career, Danny played hard. One game we're playing in Detroit and um, like a whole section of people are there like an hour before the game and I'm out shooting before the game and they have these I hate Danny Ainge shirts. <laughs> and so I asked one of the guys like, hey, you got one of those shirts for me to wear and I was wearing it and shooting and then they all like started to come down and wanted to take pictures with me and I, it was another time where I realized it's not personal, it's just part of the game, part of the entertainment, part of the fun. After retiring from the NBA, he had the opportunity to coach for the Phoenix Suns, but stepped down after three seasons, citing a need to spend more time with his family. I was listening to General Conference, and I was taking my messages to my team. You know, like I needed to be taking those messages to my family. I left coaching, and I found out that my, my family was doing fine and I needed them. Like I was missing out all the things I discovered, how much I was missing out on. His public facing career hasn't deterred his willingness to share his faith. On his Twitter profile, he includes a scripture from the Book of Mormon. That scripture to me epitomizes my personality. I don't know the meaning of all things. I have enough faith in people that I trust, that I love, that I've learned in all the callings I've worked in, in the church. I've had so many people that have helped me understand, people that I want to emulate in their lives, people that are just shining their light, that have been big influences on me in my life. And I know that God loveth his children. As you look back on your life, how can you see that the Lord has been able to use you? How do you feel like you've been able to be an instrument for good in his hands. I feel like more than anything, um, I think my people that I've worked with, from my teammates um, it, all the way through my career, I think they know that I've lived my faith. And I think that they've respected it. I feel like my faith has led me to different opportunities in life. and, and But more than anything, Morgan, it's just like I'm just happier. Like, I don't have to deal with so many of the things that I've seen other people deal with. Uh, I just feel like there have been 
angels waiting for me, directing me in certain ways. And um, not just as a player, but just in life. And I am always grateful for those people that have helped shape my life. My last question for you, Danny, is what does it mean to you to be all in the gospel of Jesus Christ? The first thing that came to my mind in, in, uh, for me is being a sports freak myself um, is all in means all in no matter what. All in in every circumstance. Um, when you're on a team and you have tough losses, and you don't get the role you want, and you don't get the shots you want, you don't get the credit you deserve, or you, you feel like you deserve. And so, yeah, I'm all in. I'm all in on um, keeping my covenants. I'm all in on being a disciple of Christ. I'm all in on doing what I can to have as much faith, hope, and charity that I can. I'd like to introduce you now to a woman whose knowledge of World War II comes not from history books, but from personal experience. The comfort and safety Mary Elliott feels now as she walks into the Salem Tennyson Swim Club is a world away from the life she lived during World War II. But at 85 years old, she doesn't let what happened to her then define her now. Okay, it's Mary from uh, Carlson Vat Young. And this is our house. We had a huge veranda there. Raised as an affluent young girl in what was then the Dutch East Indies. Here's Georgie. He had curly hair. The beautiful curly hair. Such a cutie. So here we are on the porch of, uh, on the steps of the porch, Georgie and myself. Mary's idyllic childhood was shattered when she was forced to live in a concentration camp near Java. And how old was he when he passed away? He passed away on the 1st of February, and in March he would have been seven. From the brutal living conditions to the unimaginable atrocities she faced, we uncover the human cost of war and the resilience of the human spirit. A book, Under the Java Moon, will soon be released about Mary's experiences. Tell us a little bit about what happened for your family in the very beginning as the war started to affect the area in which you lived. I was told Dad had gone away to help fight the war. And I didn't know specifically that it was Australia, but I heard this later. And then slowly, as I said, things got worse. After Pearl Harbor, the Japanese army overtook the Indonesian islands. Every now and then, the sirens would go off and we had to get into this bomb shelter. First it was practicing and then it was real. We actually saw the bombs fall. Mary was sent to a concentration camp on Java. She spent three years there with her mother and siblings. Food was scarce and conditions were rough. I have looked back to that life and to me it's a miracle that anybody actually came out of there alive. Sadly, her grandmother and brother Georgie didn't survive. When I talk about it, I, I, I want to cry because my parents were told that all three of their children were going to die. Right. And they were lucky only one did. But all three of us were so bad that we, I mean, we were skin and bones and we had measles and we had double pneumonia. How can you survive that? Once freed from the camps and reunited with her father, her family moved first to Holland and then to South Africa. Tell me about how you found the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I always wanted to know where I came from and why I was here and where I was going. And so I started praying and I prayed for two years and asking Heavenly Father if there was a true church upon the earth, that he would show it to me. Shortly thereafter, a friend in South Africa introduced she and her husband to the missionaries, and they joined the church after hearing the discussions. Quite honestly, I had to survive because the gospel had to come in my life for me to share and to do work for my ancestors. You didn't talk about this experience for 
a long time. Why do you feel compelled now to share your story and to share what you experienced and what you learned from it? People today and people to come need to know how bad war is, how bad. There are no winners in a war, there are only losers. Everybody loses in a war. People need to know that. So every day we need to be grateful for what we've got. The food was portioned, okay? And Thank heaven for the food we have on the table, for everything that we have. You made the soup, Mom? She yeah. did. Every single day, do not take it for granted. Mary, my last question for you is, what does it mean to you to be all in the gospel of Jesus Christ? It means to me, I am in it, heart, soul, and body. And I pray and ask Heavenly Father, don't take it away from me, don't let me fall away. I need it, I want it, and I love it. Thirteen years ago, Cameron Smith was a college student looking for a job when he saw a listing for a pancake company. Never in a million years could he have imagined where that listing would lead. I remember looking at that thinking, yeah, this looks kind of weird. I swear I applied to everything around that except for Kodiak Cakes. But almost in an act of desperation, knowing he had to get a job, he applied and got an interview. It was a pretty rundown area and it's pretty sketchy as you're walking in there. The office had no windows. But I remember meeting with Tina's dad and his dad had taught institutes similar to my dad and we, there was just a connection there. I remember walking out thinking, this would be so cool. I would love this. Cameron got the job and today your local grocery store shelves are probably stocked with multiple Kodiak products. So Joel says that you are the secret weapon. <laughs> And I want to talk about why that is. So initially, you came in and the, the plan was you were going to reach out to influencers, bloggers, mm -hmm. try to get kind of a presence on social media. But you started to have kind of this higher vision for Kodiak and what the company was capable of. I grew up in Nebraska and I worked at Hy-Vee, uh, a retailer there in the Midwest. And I remember thinking, well, if I could call Hy-Vee their headquarters, then maybe they could bring it into their... 200 some odd stores and so you know unbeknownst to Joel I decided to give Hy-Vee a call. Hy-Vee didn't say yes that day but Cameron never forgot the encouraging response from his employer when he mentioned the call. And it wasn't hey stay in your lane uh, don't try and branch out I want you I, I told you to do this just do this but like he allowed me to to, to do whatever and it's funny to hear like a secret weapon because I think in that moment what I brought was probably like a little stone. It was a stone of like, all right, let's, maybe we can do this. And then together we, we built this sling and then we decided, all right, let's start working on this and let's see what we can do with this. We broke a handful of windows, but then we were like, you know what, maybe we can take on Goliath. And so with Joel's blessing, Cameron pitched a Target and got Kodiak cakes in 40 Target stores. It soon became the number one selling pancake mix in Target stores nationwide. They were also featured on Shark Tank. Hey Sharks, I'm Joel Clark. And I'm Cameron Smith. Our product is Kodiak Cakes. We're Despite their efforts to be ready for the publicity surge, they couldn't have prepared themselves for what Kodiak happened next. When it aired on the East Coast, our website crashed. <laughs> the Target was calling us on Monday saying, guys, we're out of product. In 2016, Joel and Cameron brought on a private equity investor partner who informed them that Kodiak Cakes had the ability to become a billion dollar brand. And that's when the two co-founders made a bold move. Recently, you and Joel made an interesting decision to kind of take a step back. Yeah, you know, it's, it's never easy to uh, step away from something that in a lot of ways has kind of defined you. And for me, you know, th throughout the growth, I remember, I loved the story of Ammon. 
I love the moment when he's reconnected with his brothers and he says, look at what we've done. This has been so cool. Like we've helped them come to Christ. We've taught them about this. And, and Aaron's like, hey, Ammon, you're, slow down. You're kind of boasting. Like this isn't okay. Um, and Ammon's like, whoa, oh, not in my own strength. Because as to my own strength, I'm, I'm nothing. But with God's strength, I can do all things because it's, it's him. And so this isn't me. And so I've looked at this, even this journey for, from Kodiak thinking, well, this isn't me. This, this, is, this has been God. This has been him saying, hey, you need to learn in this area so you can be a better leader. Because if I can be a better leader, I can hopefully help inspire other people's lives to see that there's a lot more to life than earning a paycheck or building a brand, but maybe it can help impact their family. Maybe there can be a, a positive repercussion. My last question for you, Cameron, is what does it mean to you to be all in the gospel of Jesus Christ? One of my most favorite songs, I'll call it a hymn, it's a children's song book, um, is I'm trying to be like Jesus. And what I love about it is the emphasis on trying and then who you're trying to be like. And so that focus on I'm trying and, and every day I'm going to try to love as he loved. I'm going to try to be like him. I'm going to try to understand how he thought. For Astrid Jimenez, president of Utah Valley University, the journey to define her life and find Jesus Christ began in less than ideal circumstances. I just want to start out with your childhood. You grew up in the slums of the Philippines. So first of all, the growing up in the slums, I, I think there's nothing that peculiar about it. There are probably billions of people in the slums, even as we speak. What is peculiar about it is that I got out of it. So you grow up with a lot of indignity. You grow up uh, being exposed to death. You grow up being exposed to a lot of violence. You grow up also on the flip side, thinking about how do I help myself? How do I solve my problems? Uneducated and with little hope of becoming so, one of the problems she faced was a lack of opportunity. But that changed when Sister Elvira Correa, a local nun, saw her and offered to get her into school. Going to school at Colegio del Sagrado Corazón de Jesus, College of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, was a true pivot for me. Uh, and that pivot meant discovering that there was a, a whole world called reading. There's a whole world called numbers. And they seated the, the kids, you know, first seat, first row, the smartest, last seat, last row, the dumbest. And I was in the last seat, last row. And what was beautiful was just, um, well, this, getting the skills was wonderful with this really strict teacher. And as soon as she found out that I could do things, her name was Mrs. Turija, she would give me more and more and more. And, you know, she was moving me until I was in the first seat, first row. What does it do for a student when they have a teacher that recognizes and sees potential and encourages that potential? For me, what it means, especially now that I'm running a university, Utah Valley University, is open admission. When I applied for this job, I found that a little bit nerve-wracking that you accept everybody. That, that's sort of the opposite of everything I've known. The, the main thing I've known is to compete really, really hard. And I knew that in high school, I knew that when I started at the University of the Philippines. And I really had to look at this model and I became really quite intrigued by it and enamored by it and now totally committed to it. The UVU MBA at Silicon Slopes first of its kind. Where the purpose of education becomes not exclusion, but inclusion. And the question to ask is not, you know, who can we keep out, the riffraff, but how do you help develop every kind of human potential? When missionaries found her family, Astrid couldn't deny how the message of divine identity made her feel. And I just loved that they, you know, they were teaching that I was a child of God, that I was as worthy as anybody. And growing in a culture like that, that was so socioeconomically stratified, and you grew up thinking you're nothing, 
it was such a liberating theology, if you will, to be taught that I was a child of God and that my potential was limitless. It's, it's totally radical. It's totally revolutionary. And to get a 10-year-old to believe that, she starts thinking she's unstoppable. Which is proven to be true. Astrid has advanced degrees from both Harvard and MIT and a lucrative career in business and finance. And never one to shy away from a challenge, in 2018, she made an unexpected move, leaving a job she loved at Microsoft to become president of Utah Valley University. One of the things that's really central to me ever since I was a child was the passage of time. I remember as a little girl just crying because the day was over and I'll never get it back. And so I've always approached careers as it's just part of the one wonderful life that I have. And therefore, if something's interesting, even though I know nothing about it, I will go for it. My last question for you is what does it mean to you to be all in the gospel of Jesus Christ? To be all in in the gospel of Jesus Christ for me is to wake up every day in awe of this world and of every human being and to be able to open my eyes to everything good, bad, up, down, sorrowful, joyful, and to know that all of that is something that I need to embrace and that I need to constantly become more Christ-like. So be in awe, embrace it all, and my job is to remember that the gospel is about developing a more Christ-like character. And I have to do that with both awe and joy. As I've interviewed each of these guests, their testimonies have touched my heart and I hope that they've touched yours as well. If you'd like to listen to the full interview with each of these guests, keep an eye on ldsliving.com slash all in where you can also find many other interviews. Thank you so much for joining us.